Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show, a program exclusively designed to promote reproductive health awareness and discuss fertility preservation options. Here is your host, the Harvard-educated fertility specialist, Dr. Amy. She's known as the Egg Whisperer. Fertility expert, Dr. Amy Lazadin. And you have yet another success story just launched by an East Bay fertility doctor. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show. I am so excited to have one of the premier scientists who is investigating endometriosis and environmental toxicants on today's show. Welcome, Dr. Kevin Osteen. Thank you very much. I'm going to talk a little bit about you because you're pretty darn amazing. And I think people need to hear about all the wonderful things that you're doing to move the science forward for women who have endometriosis. You're a professor of OBGYN and pathology, microbiology, and immunology at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine, and is also an adjunct professor of OBGYN at Meharry Medical College. You currently hold the Pierre Supar Chair in Obstetrics and Gynecology, and you also direct the International Endometriosis Association, Association Research Program at Vanderbilt, and have served as an advisor to various biotech and large pharmaceutical companies. Since the 1990s, your research program has focused, and this is, you know, this is why I'm so excited to have you here, among other things, on the relevance of environmental endocrine disruptors and the pathophysiology of infertility related to the disease endometriosis. And that is quite a mouthful, but I know you're going to break it down for us. And your recent research efforts in your lab have begun to use recently developed organ on a chip technology to create the first endometrium and endometriosis chip models. These models will provide a comparative system in which to investigate the intrinsic properties and hyperinflammatory state of a normal and endometriosis endometrium that promotes disease progression. Welcome to the show. Would you tell us more about what you do and what your focus is and what brought you to OBGYN as well? Yeah, that's, that part is quite a story. Um, so I came to Vanderbilt um, to start one of the fourth, I guess the fourth IVF program in the country at that time. And I was a postdoc in Baltimore with a lady who's a fairly famous uh, ovarian physiologist who uh, was one of the people who also discovered in heaven and was really mostly an ovarian physiologist by training. My PhD is uh, endocrinology actually. actually. And so, um, when, we, when I moved to uh, Nashville, to Vanderbilt, um, I had to really start an IVF program um, based on uh, science that was developed mostly at that time, back in the mid eighties, uh, by a lot of um, animal science people. Because the, um, you know, in, in cows and horses, the embryo work was actually out in front of what we were doing in the human back at that time. So we had to um, really develop uh, clinical laboratory credentials for PhDs in animal science to be able to run human-based uh, laboratory. And so we, we wrote an exam with a, uh, uh, which is called an HCLD or high complexity clinical laboratory director. And, and most people who run IVF laboratory embryologists have taken that exam or a version of it. And so I was really um, working with the chair of pathology at Vanderbilt. Uh, and he just uh, stopped by my lab uh, one day and asked me if I would help him culture endometrial cells. He knew I cultured ovarian cells. And I said, sure. Uh, I was listening to the Brandenburg Concerto late on a Sunday night. He stopped by first to listen to the music, and then we talked some science and, and hooked up uh, as a nice team back in the 80s uh, to develop the technology to culture human endometrial tissue. And so that allowed me to, um, you know, look at really an end organ response from what the ovary was producing in terms of steroids, estrogen, and progesterone. But people didn't know as much about the endometrial response during the early IVF days. And that was something that needed more study. And then more importantly, my sister-in-law who had endometriosis asked me to do it. 
as a as an area of study. And I said, I would not tell her. That. So that's how I got into endometriosis and ovarian uh, physiologists uh, learning how to culture endometrial cells. And much of your work has been around endometriosis and how endocrine disruptors impact reproductive health. Can you share what your findings have been and what they revealed about the link between toxicants and endometriosis? Yeah, it's, it, that whole story started in the early 1990s with a, a study that had been done in primates uh, that were involved in a feeding study with um, the toxicant we study, which is commonly called dioxin, dioxin uh, or TCDD. And, and uh, what had happened, it was not an endometriosis study, but uh, 10 years later, several of the female primates died. And when they did the autopsy, we were, we were involved in that. And they had um, deep infiltrating endometriosis into the bowel. And so the animals had bowel obstruction. And it was a more invasive phenotype of, of endometriosis than you would typically see, certainly in a primate colony. And so that piqued everybody's interest. And so I was sort of uh, brought in uh, by the Endometriosis Association partners and asked if we could figure out maybe what was going on. And my lab at that time studied enzymes that allow cells to become invasive, such as cancer cells. So they're called matrix metalloproteinases. And uh, our lab uh, in, at that time uh, did the first study of these matrix metalloproteases, or we call them MMPs, in the human endometrium. And we published the first study of how they were expressed uh, during the normal menstrual cycle and how these enzymes became expressed during menstruation, but they were suppressed by exposure to progesterone, which is the progestational uh, hormone that, that creates the endometrial environment that allows implantation and preserves the endometrium and, um, during and throughout pregnancy in the human. And so by finding that progesterone was involved in suppressing the enzymes, then we looked to see maybe this toxicant was somehow interfering more with progesterone uh, than it was um, acting as an estrogen mimic. Uh, and so that's how we sort of approached the early studies um, using our human in vitro culture models. Uh, and we were able to demonstrate that this toxicant uh, was a pretty good um, uh, inhibitor of progesterone's ability to regulate the MMP system. Mm -hmm. And that then would allow uh, endometrial cells to potentially uh, exhibit a more invasive phenotype. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how we got sort of started in the uh, the toxic kind of, of interest to us are the di dioxin studies. Yeah. Where can dioxin be found in the environment? Well, dioxin is a member of a, of a family of uh, uh, toxicants uh, and people's heard of PCBs before. So these PCBs and uh, were actually used in things like transformers uh, and sort of um, uh, in industry sort of uh, uses. And, and they're really persistent toxicants. They're not used anymore in the transformers or heat exchangers that, like they used to be. Um, but dioxin is also created uh, by, it's a product of combustion. And so um, if you follow um, um, sort of the studies about this, you would see that it's not really generated as something that anybody wants to make. It's a byproduct and it's one of the more toxicant uh, of the PCB family. And so um, currently, for example, humans would be exposed at a high level. Uh, our soldiers in Iraq or Afghanistan because of oil fires and burn pits. And so, it, and it was also a contaminant in Agent Orange during the Vietnam War. Uh, and so the soldiers uh, that were spraying Agent Orange um, could have been exposed to fairly high levels. And so that, you know, our interest in, in terms of the women with endometriosis uh, then also extends to where you live uh, 
um, and uh, and that could have uh, an impact on level of exposure. It's just the, it gets in these toxins get into the food chain, and so we ingest them in food and water is, and then they're carried by weather and patterns, and so they can accumulate. Uh, um, in the United States, where the weather pattern would take a lot of these across New England, for example, just the weather pattern. And what's the difference between a toxicant and a toxin? I mean, you hear people talk about environmental toxins and we're using the term toxicant. Can you clarify the difference for us? Yes, I mean, so we, we started, you know, thinking of them as toxins too, but, but really when, when we started studying it from the chemical perspective and the chemist, then the toxicant is something that's being produced by some um, uh, process such as uh, combustion, whereas toxicant, toxins are generally um, produced by various uh, uh, animals as uh, defense mechanisms, so like snake venom is a toxin, for example, and certain frogs produce toxins on their sur uh, uh, for defense mechanisms that animals would use as mm -hmm. toxins. Yeah. So you recently published an article titled Early Environmental Toxicant Exposure and Reproductive Health, and you covered some really fantastic fascinating new ground in the field. And I, and, I, and I love that you're here to talk to us about it. And some of what you discovered was how toxicants can impact reproductive health in a transgenerational capacity. And before we get to those findings, I wanna make sure the audience understands the organ on a chip technology or endo chip that you're using to model human endocrine systems. Can you explain to us how that works? Yes, so, so uh, basic culture models that people have used um, um, have cells in a, a static sort of location. So a tissue culture model uh, would be, you put cells in a petri dish and then you change the media every once in a while. And those cells are really not representative of cells in an organ in the body in which blood and nutrients flow across a, an organ system. Uh, and then the waste is carried away by the, by the uh, vascular tour in an organ system. And so um, the organ on the chip technology allows us to have a microfluidic flow uh, of nutrients uh, and culture media through a, a, a culture environment that mo is more representative of how an organ is exposed to products of the blood or hormones uh, in the blood. And I don't know if you can see it if I hold it up, but that's a that's an organ on the chip model of the endometrium. They're they're called microfluidic because they're very small, and allows small volumes of uh, culture media. And then you have a pump system that can be um, devised in, uh, to deliver uh, nutrients to your cells, but you can also uh, expose the cells to toxicants or, to, or hormones uh, uh, in order to test the impact of the toxicant. Now, of course, if you do toxicology in people, everything we know is from retrospective accidental exposure. You don't expose people on purpose to a toxicant that you know could be detrimental. So the only way, other than animal models, that we can really study in a prospective fashion, what a toxicant might do to an organ system is to have a three-dimensional in vitro system that mirrors uh, the way uh, cells are uh, responding to hormones or toxicants in the body. And what have you discovered about the endometrium by studying it on the endochip? Well, the, the main things we were able to do and demonstrate um, is that the um, toxicant that we study um, actually acts on human endometrial cells um, to um, epigenetically modify progesterone receptors. Now I'm going to have to define epigenetics for you, I think for your audience, that we all know that we have genetics as our, you know, that we uh, got from our parents and we have genes that we got from our fathers and our mothers. Epigenetics means on top of genetics is what it means. And epigenetics is ways in which the gene uh, can be modified so that it's expressed or not expressed. And you know, as organs develop, you know, uh, liver doesn't need the same 
um, um, proteins made as the heart does. And so you, there are natural mechanisms by which certain genes are suppressed in the body uh, along a line of differentiation to a special tissue. Well, it turns out that um, epigenetics is also a mechanism by which toxicants can act to modify the expression of really important genes. And what we were able to show and other colleagues in the field uh, was that the um, toxicant we study uh, epigenetically modifies the promoter region of the progesterone receptor gene and makes, makes the progesterone receptor itself to be expressed at a lower level. And, and as a physician, you know that women with endometriosis have this uh, resistance to progesterone. Uh, and, and so we can generate that endometrial phenotype uh, in the laboratory using the organ on a chip technology. Mm -hmm. And is epigenetic similar to transgenerational? Or do you use those words synonymously? And what's the difference between you know, seeing yeah. something as right. epigenetically versus transgenerational risk? Okay, so one of the things that we are able to do in the lab, um, again, we, we cannot do exposures to human populations. We always do that on organ on the chip model or cultures. But we do have a mouse model of exposure during pregnancy in which we expose a pregnant mouse to this toxicant at the end of her pregnancy. And then she has her babies that are born and those babies would be called the F1 generation. So there's the mom, it's the F0, the babies, the F1. And then when you expose the mom during pregnancy, the babies are exposed, the fetuses are exposed, the feti. And then the uh, germ cells in the ovaries of the babies that are born were also exposed. And so those would become the F2 generation of mice. And so when a pregnant woman is exposed to a toxicant, she's exposing herself, if you, uh, you know, the baby, the feet of the baby, and the germ cells in the baby that's gonna become the baby's babies all at one time. And so that's called multi-generational. To get to transgenerational, you have to actually go to the F3, which is are the great grandchildren. And so those are the first offspring that were not directly exposed during that initial pregnancy. And that's called transgenerational as opposed to multigenerational. So in our mouse model, the F3 um, babies um, have a phenotype which is not unlike the phenotype of the F1 babies, which were directly exposed to the toxica. And so there are no other exposures after, except for that first pregnancy. And the third generation still carries a reduced sensitivity to progesterone and an increased risk of infertility and increased risk of preterm birth um, if they are fertile. Mm -hmm. And so this, this is what we, you know, um, sadly identified actually is that the exposure has a foreshadows problems across several generations mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you don't have to have a direct exposure. Right. And I, I understand how the technology will be used to help fertility patients by what you've already shared, but can you share with our audience, how can we use this technology to improve fertility outcomes um, for, for people moving forward? You know, one of the most important things we found, and so I have a colleague named Kaylin Bruner Tran. So if you look at my publications, you'll see hers as well. Um, and her interest has been a um, couple of things different. She's interested in the male so when we have these babies in the mouse colony, we, uh, we have male babies and we've identified that the male babies have their own infertility phenotype. They have uh, reduced sperm production, re reduced sperm quality. And the thing for your patients, I think that's most interesting and not always understood 
is that the placenta of pregnancy is derived largely by the paternal genes. And so the dad's exposure can change the phenotype of the placenta. And so in, in our animal model, it didn't matter whether the mom was the exposed per, uh, animal or, or the father was the exposed animal, we got the same transgenerational phenotype. So when I, when I would talk in front of uh, endometriosis patients, uh, often their fathers would go somewhat white when they heard that maybe their daughter <laughs> is suffering from endometriosis because of something in their background. And that's often not appreciated. And so one thing to understand is the father's history uh, of to potential toxic exposure should be uh, taken as part of the history of the patient uh, when, when they're counseled for a, an IVF procedure. And the other thing was um, the more hopeful uh, component was we've been able to nutritionally intervene uh, in, in the you know in the animal model as a proof of principle and reduce the risk of infertility and preterm birth in the offspring. And the reason that works is because of the anti-inflammatory diet that's a more healthy diet. Um, and that's something I think your, your patients would, would appreciate and, and want to know is in general, um, our diet has, is an inflammatory diet. The Western diet is not particularly healthy in terms of being an inflammatory like diet with the amount of red meat and sugars and uh, corn syrup uh, in particular. And the uh, original sort of hunter-gatherer diet would have been 50%, 50% omega-3, 50% omega-6. Uh, and you need both, um, but American diet can be 30 to 1 omega-6 to omega-3. And so um, in terms of having an anti-inflammatory diet or a healthy diet prior to the initiation of pregnancy would be the advice that we would give from our observations that many people, they show up once they're pregnant to their gynecologist or the MFM, and they don't really plan for the pregnancy. Um, and, and it would be much better if we all planned for healthy pregnancies uh, and adjusted our diets and, uh, and other ways that we take care of ourselves, emotionally, um, you know, exercise, diet, uh, the other things that uh, general well-being before you you become pregnant would be ideal. Right. It's not always possible, but right. And you also mentioned taking a careful history from the sperm source. So, what kind of questions should I be asking to make sure I'm not missing something really important for my patients? You know, it's it's one of the things that's um, most difficult to to answer definitively because. In animal models like we study, we can put the animals on a special diet and they have no other choice. You know, they can't go out to McDonald's and you know, on the weekend or whatever that they might want to do. And so with people um, who, who really, um, you know, they eat a lot of different foods, they, they, they may exercise or not, they, they um, may not be aware of, um, uh, the toxic history that they might have, what their father or even grandfather or grandmother might have done. And it's very difficult. You, nobody can go back and change what their father or, or, or grandfathers or grandmothers did. And so in general, um, we believe that um, probably dietary intervention is the easiest, simplest thing that people can do for themselves. Now, you know, in, in our world, like I said, we don't do prospective human um, 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 exposures to toxicants that we know might be harmful. Um, but the data would say women that live within four kilometers of an incinerator have a higher risk of preterm birth, for example. 
And those kind of studies would say, okay, they looked at the women, they looked at the medical history, but did anybody ask about the father? Where did he live? Probably there as well. And you know, and what was uh, you know the history of, of uh, the entire sort of family unit? And some of the people obviously can't move because of where they live, you know. And, and again, uh, we have Meharry Medical College, where have the adjunct appointment. It's one of the uh, top uh, minority uh, focused medical schools in the country, and so you know, social justice and environmental justice is something they think a lot about. And our students from Meharry, um, you know, know that um, women of color would have twice the risk of preterm birth as uh, Caucasians. And, and we don't know all of the genetics or epigenetics uh, about that, but we do know that where you live um, and your access to nutritional food can, can make a difference. And those are the things I think that we can control more than um, our, our history of what, what our grandparents and grand, grandparents did. Mm -hmm. The information you're sharing with us today is extremely important for all my patients to hear, even if you're not my patient, for people who are you know, planning a pregnancy, I feel like it's vital for people to know this. And so thank you for all the work that you do. I have several other questions. I know you've already probably answered them, but I just love hearing you talk. So I'm just gonna ask you some more questions and you've probably already touched on some of them already with some of your awesome answers. I wanna go back to the endo chip and how eventually we can use this technology to improve fertility outcomes. Well, uh, with the chip, one of the things that we're doing and we're, we're, we have some new funding by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to have um, a chip that's called the endochip, married also to a chip called the MFI chip, the maternal fetal interface. And so the Gates Foundation has interest in contraceptives, for example, but every contraceptive, there's a failure rate. And so what happens if you test that contraceptive in a chip device that would mirror the beginning of a pregnancy, then we could see you know, this particular contraceptive um, would be more detrimental uh, to that, to a pre early pregnancy. And even though it might be a reasonably good contraceptive, which is not what you're trying to do in general. <laughs> but, but that's you know, an example of you can test uh, a, a drug before it would go into you know, you know, clinical trial using uh, a human tissue based um, model so that you don't go into trial and have a bad outcome that you can pick up by, by testing it directly in, in a reproductive system. And so I think the, and of course there, you know, the organ on the chips uh, in general, there are several organ on the chips that we have within our biomedical group at Vanderbilt. There's even a brain on the chip, for example. And so we're, you're able to see how organs interface. We, we put a, a liver on a chip upstream of our endometrium on the chip so that we can test the metabolites of a drug or a toxicant uh, that comes across the liver, gets metabolized, and then affects the next organ system. So those kind of interactive organ-to-organ -organ communication can be done in the organ on the chip uh, system um, before you would ever do those trials um, in, in a human population. And the organ on chips, uh, for all of those who, us who do care about the use of animals in research, it lets us reduce the use of animals for research, which is really important. Yeah. Are there any tips or words of wisdom that you would have for people who are listening to us today who have endometriosis or are worried about toxicants in the environment? Yes, I mean, I think that um, being aware of where the toxicants um, are being generated, um, you know, uh, being aware of the foods that you eat, um, you know, again, uh, trying to avoid uh, having an inflammatory diet, um, you know, thinking about that, that I think um, 
you know, there, for example, we have, um, you know, colleagues in Japan, they, they don't have landfills. They incinerate all of their trash. And so they have a whole institute building that's dedicated to these toxicants that we study because they would really be concerned about that. And so I think it's a matter, and they're looking at, again, is there, there are ways that you could chelate a toxicant and remove it from the body. But that, to me, that's, you know, that's way downstream and uh, from what we should be doing in terms of just taking better care through choosing the, the foods that we eat. I know you have to advise your patients about they should have more, eat more fish, right, from good omega-3s, but certain fish, you know, the, the top of the food chain fish, uh, like sharks uh, or tunas, will have um, more toxins that they accumulate because of all the, the smaller fish that continue to accumulate. And so while you do want to have uh, a fish rich diet, you want to be choosy about uh, the type of fish that you would, you would eat. Um, and then of course you can, you can take fish oil as it's uh, uh, people in my group, several <laughs> of us do that. Uh, uh, and so I, I think it's a matter of taking care of your body nutritionally uh, and, uh, and again, being aware of where the toxicants are uh, being generated and um, um, you know, there's a lot of good information uh, on the web about uh, the toxicants and and uh, and what you might not want to do do uh, in terms of your own exposure. Things like grilling meats is one way to create some of these toxicants. Obviously, smoking is one way to generate some of the toxicants. So, we can use the cigarette smoke extract in our organ on a chip model and we get the same impact we get from exposure to the dioxin. Yeah. So, um, you know, it, it, that's, there's some personal choices we can make to reduce the uh, uh, toxicants uh, that, that we can choose not to do as much of. And then there are, again, nutritional interventions, um, choosing uh, anti-inflammatory diet that can work against the toxicant. Uh, the toxicant that we study, um, without getting too much into the cell biology, seems to do its negative work by creating pro-inflammatory cytokine storm in, in the, within the endometrial cells and the immune system. And so it's the, the pro-inflammatory cytokines seem to be doing the dirty work of the toxicant downstream from the exposure. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we say we always focus so much on anti-inflammatory intervention. I think it would be great. I, I'm not sure if you've ever been approached by any documentarian to kind of document everything that you're sharing and then actually you know, show people what happens when you expose the endo on the you know, endo chip to the different things that you're sharing and then showing people what happens. I feel like if people actually see it, they, they will believe it better than me just talking about it and saying things like it's bad for your sperm or it's bad for your eggs. I feel like if I can say, click here, watch this video and you'll see exactly how bad it is. No, that's right. I, um, and uh, you know, the visual part of this, um, you know, when you show, we can show um, immune cells um, really tracking to the endometrium, um, tracking to endometriosis, uh, and, and creating this sort of pro-inflammatory um, microenvironment that, that would drive the disease process. And so we're, um, you know, there's, there's an area of research, um, again, it gets a little bit more technical sometimes, but most people are aware that when you get a vaccine, uh, you know, now with the COVID, everybody's thinking about this, that you get some immunity uh, to the coronavirus, for example. But there's, there's uh, areas of immunity where if you were vaccinated against um, one sort of um, uh, like a candida type um, infection, that you could have immunity develop against a, another uh, even unrelated infection. 
And so this is a new concept called immune cell training that shows that innate immune cells, which are the, the first line of defense as opposed to the acquired immunity, which is the antibodies and um, secondary sort of protection, that innate immune cells remember their exposure to an infection. And the next time they're exposed, they have an altered reaction, a more defensive reaction generally. And that would be a hyper inflammatory response. But some things can cause the immune cells to have a reduced expression, which would be a hypo response. And that could be like diminishing immune response to a cancer where the cancer causes the immune system to be less effective in attacking the cancer cell. So this immune cell training appears to be very similar to the immune reactions we're seeing to the toxicant. And so we're currently looking at how much of the risk for endometriosis is being carried by immune cells themselves. And could that even be part of the transgenerational um, effects that we're seeing? And so Dr. Brenner Tran can show the babies that are born to our mice would have more necrotizing intercolitis because of their, their mother's um, or father's toxic exposure. So I think we're going to see more and more of immunomodulation that can be pharmaceutical going forward. In addition, you know, we use dietary because pregnant women don't need too many pharmaceuticals, as you know. And we just we don't and haven't been tested in pregnant women for the most part. And so that's why we say nutritional intervention. But in the father, you know, before a pregnancy, an anti-inflammatory um, drug could could potentially be useful. So I think downstream immunomodulatory mechanisms are going to be uh, more and more involved in preventing the development of endometriosis. And that will be a great day because endometriosis is one of the worst things that I can deal, you know, that as a fertility doctor, I deal with it. As you know, it causes the ovaries to age faster than my patient's chronological age, no matter how good their fertility levels are or how young they are. If endometriosis is present, it can really cause a lot of damage and decrease risk of implantation, increase risk of miscarriage. Right. So I appreciate all the work that you're doing. Is there anything else you want to share with our audience? Well, one of the things I think you touched on it just a little bit is our goal, and I think one of the articles you read, is our goal would be able to identify uh, the risk in the young woman or the young man um, prior, prior to them developing endometriosis or related inflammatory condition, and then being able to intervene effectively so that they never become the endometriosis patient. We would like to put you out of business. I, you know. <laughs> I don't want to have any patients. I want, that would be amazing. I mean, if we can literally find a cure before it even became a problem, that would be literally a dream come true for me. Yeah. So, thank you. Well, Dr. Osteen, thank you for joining us on the Egg Whisperer Show. For people who want to read more about you and your research, where can they go? You know, I mean, they can uh, contact you know, me directly, it's, it's, and we can try to answer as many questions as possible. So I'm just Kevin.Osteen at VUMC, Vanderbilt University Medical Center dot org. And so that's, and then I can uh, send a question along to our clinical partners when it's appropriate. But, um, and they can, uh, they can Google me and find some of this work out there as well and some people do, so. Good. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your dedication to this field. And I so appreciate you. Thank you. You're welcome. My best. Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show, a program exclusively designed to promote reproductive health awareness and discuss fertility preservation options. Here is your host, the Harvard-educated fertility specialist, Dr. Amy. She's known as the Egg Whisperer. Fertility expert, Dr. Amy Abazadeh. And you have yet another success story just launched by an East Bay fertility doctor. 